Uh, good morning to the Karen YouTube audience. Uh, if you're um, tuning in at some future date, this happens to be Easter Sunday, uh, the 17th of April, 2022. And good morning again to those of you who are with me in person and those uh, older adults who are anywhere else on campus who might be watching on live stream. Really, really grateful to be here. So enthusiastic, not only uh, because of the beautiful weather and the celebration of um, key uh, faith holidays on this particular weekend, um, but also because um, we continue to experience a uh, ability as a campus to have relaxed our restrictions from pandemic concerns and to have people actually come to chapel. Uh, so just, um, I'm in a good mood. Hope you are as well. Sometimes people are not in a great mood for obvious reasons when they're here. Um, and I'm sensitive to that. So I'll try and like uh, be careful. But I wanted to recall for you, my journey into being a clergy person is uh, one that I mention often, pretty much every Sunday, but I started my recovery uh, identifying as an atheist and very cynical and suspicious of people who were established religious professionals. So it's ironic and peculiar that I would stand before you today as a validly ordained member of a Protestant denomination. And I had grown up in a Roman Catholic family. I also have been trained as an interfaith minister and uh, learned a lot about the wisdom traditions of the world and uh, find it um, my unique privilege to be tasked to speak from a wide variety of perspectives every Sunday and really enjoy that. Today I'm going to be a little more narrow and specific in the stories I brought from, sort of for obvious reasons, and not only being Easter Sunday, but today is the second day of the Passover festival. So another uh, key, uh, there's two nights of, uh, of high observance for those who are uh, profoundly observant in the Jewish tradition, uh, two consecutive nights, and then the end of the Passover comes uh, a week from yesterday. But uh, we're right in the moment of the key observances of those two. And we happen also to be in the midst of Ramadan, uh, which is a month-long observance uh, in Islam that uh, also has a celebratory aspect to it. And this dynamic between celebration and misery that I hinted at, like I know people are sometimes kind of, I don't want to be here, and here's the uh, celebrant talking about, yay! Um, I, want to, I want to connect that dissonance uh, in, a, in a particular way. So as I was trained in my Protestant training to become a church leader, and growing in my sobriety, I had a woman who had a dr dramatic effect on me uh, in my first seminary education. Her name was Deidre Prewald. I'm pretty sure Deidre is no longer alive, but she was awesome and peculiar and perky and, um, uh, and, and brilliant. And one of the things that she taught me about was that as I would go on to work in uh, church ministry, one of the things I might find is that uh, different churches would celebrate the beginning of Lent, which happens with Ash Wednesday, with a practice I had never heard of before, and I'm not sure if any of you had heard of, which is the burying of Alleluias. Anybody hear that? So what the, what, what the children in the Sunday school in that tradition do is they take the word Alleluia, they put it on flags or banners or pieces of paper, they put it in a kind of a God box or a time capsule, and they bury it in the churchyard. The purpose of the, of the observance being that during the season of Lent, which is 46 days if you count the Sundays, in that period of time you don't sing the word Alleluia, you don't say the word Alleluia in the church service, and, and, and that time of praise and celebration that that word is associated with is, is given a, a break. So there's a somberness and a kind of struggle to the Lenten period, and then on Easter Sunday morning, you unearth this Alleluia word, and the trumpet sound, and the lilies are there in the, in the uh, sanctuary, and um, those of you who are on the camera don't know, but we just heard the Leonard Cohen song, Hallelujah. Hallelujah and Hallelujah are just one accent away from each other, but, but really basically the same word in the sacred traditions, a word of praise and glory and celebration in the face of struggle. And so... Um, here we are on a morning when there are communities out there that are in those traditions that are uh, 
coming in, even there was a, a tradition in the Christian movement of sunrise uh, services that began early morning. I was out and about at sunrise this morning. It was quite beautiful. And, and, and that whole idea of a new day dawning, when there is an occasion for joy, when the days right behind us have been kind of miserable, is a perfect fit for people in treatment. Like, there is, there is a misery that gets you to the place called Magic Mountain. And we hope that there is a bright future ahead. So there's this synchronicity between the sacred stories that converge on this day and the personal experiences of the family members and individuals who are sitting in front of me that, that bears notice and some reflection on. And I'd like to dig just a hair deeper and think about another one of my teachers who helped me um, reflect on what happened to me to go from cynical, secular, atheist to church preacher with a progressive interfaith twist. And what happened to me to go from profoundly alcoholic to person in recovery? And maybe what's happening to you? So uh, as, I, as I finished my seminary education, I had already begun to be uh, what they called a student pastor. And then I was given responsibility as the lead pastor in churches. But I continued to be interested in education and theology. So I enrolled in an advanced curriculum, a, a, a doctoral program at a school called Catholic University, which was interesting, it was kind of a move back to my roots. And I had another professor, a guy named Joe Kamontrak. And I'm pretty sure Joe's level of ranking in the hierarchy of the Catholic tradition was at that time a Monsignor. Um, I'm sure Joe is no longer alive, but, and I don't know if he finished as a Monsignor or, uh, or perhaps uh, a higher, but, but Joe was a very important person in Catholic theological circles because he had been a scholar at Vatican II, at the Vatican II Councils. So um, he was viewed as an expert on what the, they call ecclesiology, which is the understanding of the nature of the church. And here, I was this Protestant <coughs> mutt um, in this sort of very pure, high academic circle, and my PhD advisor suggested that I do an independent study with um, Professor Kamanchek on the nature of the church because of what my program was and that was an area in which I was lacking maybe some preparation. So I had this opportunity to have this conversation with this world reputation uh, erudite fellow and uh, I was a little terrified because he had a reputation for being uh, really tough and really brilliant. And uh, there I was, I'll never forget that conversation, I was in the room, and he was putting me on the grill. He was like, so, uh, Jack, Kevin told me that you were coming my way, and um, uh, uh, tell me what you think is the nature of the church. And so I was like, hmm. uh, and I'm improvising and trying to like, show I, I, could, I could fend my way in this environment. But I don't know if you ever thought about what the nature of, of let's say Judaism or Christianity or Islam or Buddhism is and how you would answer such a question. Eventually, Professor Kamanchak got me to understand what he believed was the essential nature of the movement of Christianity. And it was a, like a chain reaction, almost like a chemistry event, in which uh, like a catalyst is introduced in a solution and the, and the entire solution becomes crystallized or whatever. The, the, the beginning of the chain reaction is the thing that is remembered on Easter morning, which is women discovering an empty tomb. Kind of interesting that women are involved in it. And also um, the, the, that an absence becomes this sort of moment of testimony to dramatic presence. But when these women come upon the tomb that they would have expected to find their beloved Jesus in, and no longer is he is his corpse there, they run back and spread a message. And what Joe was saying was that at some point in my life, I had been the recipient of the hand-me-down of that message. And that the essence of Christianity was this ripple, this, this spreading set of, uh, um, for those who are into physics, interference patterns of like 
one person tells another, or even a, in COVID, epidemiology, the spread of a, of a, of a viral, like a, a, a kind of a message going out into the world and into history and continuing. And Joe was like, the day that people stop telling that story is the day Christianity no longer exists. Doesn't mean there wouldn't be a historical testimony to a fellow and to the whole thing, but the, the day people stop seeing it as a important or sacred event that's essential to the heart of the movement is when Christianity no longer has its thing. So it's not usual for me to talk that much about a particular tradition, but I'm going to jump to another one which has a similar property. And I think that maybe all the wisdom traditions, you could argue, perhaps have something like this, that they have sentinel or divining, divining, that's, a, that's the wrong word, uh, uh, defining moments, and then they are carried on through this kind of pass it on tradition. The, the quick hop is Passover. So, and I don't know who's Jewish in the room and how many people uh, know about that or have ever had the privilege of being at a Seder. I have, I'm not Jewish, but I've had the privilege of uh, being at Seder tables a number of times in my life. Great invitation. If you ever get invited to the Seder, I strongly encourage you to take the invitation. It's the tradition, part of the tradition is to invite a guest. And so if you get invited, you should feel really honored and you should try to go. Um, if, if, if at all possible, because I think it's, um, it's, it's a cool thing to observe. But the tradition of the Seder observance has this hand-me-down quality. Um, if, if it's followed, which Seders are often chaotic and ill-behaved, they don't necessarily follow the rubrics of a sort of carefully delineated, unless you have somebody in the family who is really a control freak. Because there's something chaotic and messy about Judaism that, I, that makes me love it. And, uh, but, but part of that Jewish tradition is that at the table, now the table is set, and the person, the youngest person at the table, asks the oldest person at the table, why is this night different than any other night? Did you, you know that that's like the, that's the sort of spark question of the, of the Haggadah, which is the script of the Seder meal. And and then the oldest person recalls essential elements of the Exodus story, the liberation of the children of Abraham, who had ended up in Egypt feeling like it was a good place for them to go and in good favor because Joseph, who had taken them into Egypt, um, had the sort of like positive relations, but they were still strangers in a strange land. And then all of a sudden the tide turns and they become entirely unwelcome and the uh, and, and, and they're, they're victims of horrific persecution and difficulty, and they find themselves needing to flee. And in their flight, at the end, there's this grim, grim story of the tragic death of their firstborn children. It's a, it's a horrible, horrible story. But there is a witness to something sacred happening in the middle of catastrophe, which is escape and a new beginning, and a chance at oh, survival and the establishment of a whole new, um, new start. Hilariously and ironically, as soon as this community is brought out of this terrifying moment, they start complaining. None of us would ever do that, right? But, but, but so on, um, Friday night and Saturday night, Jewish families around the planet have gathered and enacted this retelling. Now it's not a telling in an academic setting or in a, in a synagogue. It's actually in, within families, but it's still a ripple. It's still one of these chain reaction events in which the children receive the memory of the rescue of the adults and are able to pass on this wisdom and knowledge that is held within the community. I was driving up this morning, I had a long, beautiful drive in the sunrise, and I was thinking, often when I am able to speak in or around the Easter occasion, Passover is usually near, but it's not always the case that Ramadan is happening at the same time. And, uh, and Ramadan has a little bit of the same pass pass it on flavor because part of the essence of the Ramadan festival is it's the time in which it's remembered that the Quran was, was provided to the prophet of that tradition. And 
So it's a, it's a, it's a reception. I, maybe it's totally obvious and I don't even need to say it, but my, my thought was that we are here on Magic Mountain because of people who have handed on a recovery tradition. Richard Karen and Catherine Karen were, are buried right out here and they were recipients of a recovery tradition that was carried on at a place called Hazelden, now Hazelden Bend Ford, and that was a treatment tradition, but also part of what the magic of what happened in Richard Karen's life was a tradition that's encoded in the 12 steps on that placard on the wall there, and goes back to an event in 1935 that is um, commemorated as Founders Day in Alcoholics Anonymous, June 10th, 1935, when Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob get together and, and, the, and the conversation that they have together is a defining and sentinel event for a movement of which I am a part and maybe many of us in the room will either become a part of or at least can be affected by and benefit from, which is the 12-step recovery thing. And today there are other expressions of recovery and it's, um, it's, it's grown and proliferated just like the sacred traditions multiply and diversify over time. But the, the 1935 event, there's a portrait. If I was using PowerPoint, I would have the screen down and I would show you. There's a famous picture in the lore of Alcoholics Anonymous in which Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob Smith are pictured in a hospital with a fellow on the bed and they are there with a book in their lap. And I, I think the title of the painting is, um, if I were to title it, would call it The Calling of AA Number Three. It's, the, it's, it's, it's their invitation to the person who would become the third member of the movement, right? So two, recruit a third person. Bill D was his, so it's, so it's two Bills and a Bob. And, and today, we have more than two million people who identify themselves as constituents of Alcoholics Anonymous, but we are recipients of that kind of transmission of a, of a story of horrific suffering not needing to be uh, ending in misery and grimness, but instead opening onto this world of possibility and new life that is really remarkable. And I wonder where you are in that as an individual in the, um, in the auditory ripple of this message. Are you, are you in fear? Are you in de despair? Are you in hopelessness? Are you in, or around, are you on the edge of death? Like, are you, are there, um, I was in an AA meeting on um, Friday morning with my sponsor, and there was a guy there, I've seen him there the last several weeks, he's um, uh, really made an impression on me because he's the recipient of a liver transplant. And, and one of the things he says is, why any doctor would give an alcoholic a liver transplant, I don't know, but he said, I can't, every year I call my surgeon and I let him know I'm still alive like to make him feel better about having taken a chance on me. And that really struck me. And uh, I know there are those of you who are in the room who are terrified about what may be ahead. But, but this place and this day and this tradition, these traditions that I'm talking about are here in our shared memory to give us hope when the when adversity looms large and despair threatens and fear is like wanting to win the day because i am sure that you have a person in your history a, a member of your family tradition or somebody in your loved one circle or someone around you or somebody your neighbor right next to you would say i got through X, or I, I, I thought I was going to not make it through Y, and, and here I am with another opportunity for another day when I can begin to write a different story of who I am and how I conduct myself in my life. And uh, I, 
I think that's one of the most hopeful things about recovery is that it's, it's not a going back. I don't like the we of the recovery word because it suggests we go back to something. But I think the most extraordinary thing that happens here all the time is that people make new themselves. They, they author the next chapter of their lives in ways that redefine their whole existence. So if you knew me in 1989, you would tell a different story about Jack Abel. But, but if you get to meet Jack Abel in 2022, then the pre-1989 Jack Abel has to be measured against the things that have happened since 1989. And they're not all wonderful. I'm sad to say I've done some really idiotic things since I got sober. But I am a recipient of the Bill B. AA number three miracle. There were people who shared a message like I'm trying to share this morning with me. And I could start to name them, except I'd take more time than I committed to myself to take today, because I want to like get to other sharing today. So in, in conclusion, what I want to invite you to do is think about, have you buried your hallelujah? Have you quieted your joyful song? Have you given up on something about yourself or your loved one or your recovery? Are you in Eeyore town? You know? And, and would you hear that you don't have to stay there? That there is hope and life and triumph. And I, I know I'm praying it for the people of Ukraine. I know I'm praying it for people in our communities that are oppressed and suffering. And I know I pray it for every single person and family affected by addiction. Because I have watched Easter happen over and over and over again. I have seen the Passover. And I, yes, we have seen the deaths of our firstborn children, some of us. My oldest brother is deceased and suffered miserably from this illness. But I have also seen a, an extraordinary healing and rescue happen in families even who have lost that much. So today, we set our sights not on the pain and